Today we are honoring the late television, movie, and stage actress, Betty White. The name of our program is Rest in Peace, Betty. She was a phenomenal actress, a phenomenal comedian, and an overall just nice person. It's very difficult to find anyone who has anything to say about Betty White except the good things. We're bringing you this tribute today to Betty White thanks to the Concordia Parish Public Library's director, Amanda Taylor and her staff, and Delta Bank, all of whom are sponsoring this program for us. Betty Marion White Ludden was born January 17, 1922 in Oak Park, Illinois, and she died on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2021 in Los Angeles, California. I'm telling you, 1922 must have been the year to be born for creative people. Look at this list of people who were born the same year she was. Judy Garland, Veronica Lake, Jack Kerouac, Doris Day, B. Arthur, Dorothy Dandridge, Jack Klugman, Carl Reiner, Red Fox, Stan Lee, Ruby D, Telly Savalas, and Kirk Vonnegut Jr. She outlived every one of them. She was asked once, what, do you, what about retirement? I mean, you're in your 90s now. Don't you think it's time to retire? And this is what she said, retirement is not in my vocabulary. They aren't going to get rid of me that way. I'm a teenager trapped in an old body. I looked at three books to gather the information to get today for you and to recommend to you that you read. The first one was published in January of this year. It was published less than two weeks after her death. Uh, it's called Betty White, The Biography. It's a little thin book, and it's Publishers University Press. It is a quick summary of her life, which was no small trick because she lived quite a long time, clearly 99 years, and she had a very robust career. It's a good first book to look and, and to read to get just a quick summary view of the big points of her life. The second book that I used was published back in 2021, last year, October the 5th. It was in anticipation of her 100th birthday, of course. It was written by Paula Bernstein, and it's titled, How to Be Golden, Lessons We Can Learn from Betty White. Bernstein is a journalist, and she has written other books, a very similar one to this one, about Mary Tyler Moore. It's published by the Running Press Adult Group, and again, it was published in 2021. It's an interesting book because it looks at, again, Betty White's life and her career, but it also takes from the events of her life lessons learned, not just lessons learned by Betty White, but lessons that we can learn from her life experience and the way she reacted to it. The third book I used was written by Betty White herself. Now, she's written several, but this one is my personal favorite. Title is Here We Go Again, My Life in Television. Scribner published it, and it was published in 2010. The reason I love this particular book is that it's Betty's life told Betty's way. She was never one to hide the truth. She, unlike some of the characters that she played, was not a, a vicious um, man chaser, nor was she a ditzy, totally naive airhead. She was a very grounded woman who understood that there were opportunities and she wanted to grasp them, and she did. When she was asked about what it was like to be you know, honored the way she has been, particularly in the last portion of her life. She said, about being called a legend, I just laugh. Have I got them fooled? 
She never take, took herself too seriously. And I think that's one of the reasons we can enjoy her life so much. She was a devoted child to a pair of devoted parents. She said in later years that there was nothing but laughter in her home when she was growing up. She said dinner was an amazing opportunity. We just sat there and shot one-liners at each other. This is a picture of her as an infant being held by her mother. She said she got her smile from her mother, but she got her dimples from her daddy. She also said that their marriage was not perfect, that there were certainly times when she was growing up when there were some rocky places, but they somehow worked through them and the marriage seemed stronger every time. And she said that was what set the model for her as to what marriage should be. Her daddy's name is Horace Logan White. He was born in 1899 and he died in 1963. He was an electrical engineer, a salesman, and an executive for a lighting company. She said about him, during the depression, my dad made radios to sell to make extra money. Nobody had any money to buy the radios, so he would trade them for dogs. He built kennels in the backyard and he cared for the dogs. Part of this, she would say in later interviews, was because her father knew that the people who had the animals didn't have enough to take care of them. And so he was taking in the animals as much to save the animals as he was to provide a radio to the people who needed one so desperately. She also said that she was the only kid on her block that her parents would come in and say, he followed us home, can we keep him, can we, can we? And it'd be a dog that they had found somewhere on the street. So her home was always filled with dogs. Her mother was named Tess, and she was a homemaker. White said the month that she died, in a statement that she gave to Fox News, she said, quote, I've always been a cockeyed optimist. I got it from my mom. I'm gonna stick with it. And she did for her whole life. Here's a picture of perfectly delightful on her sixth birthday. She's quite a little scamp, and you can see the dimples. Betty's parents named her Betty, not Elizabeth, because they didn't like the nicknames that came with Elizabeth, like Liz, Lizzie, Liza. They had a, a small apartment in Oak Park, Illinois, but when Betty was between one and a half and two, somewhere in there, they moved to California. Her grandparents were of Danish, Greek, English, and Welsh heritage. She said, my mother and dad were big animal lovers. I just don't know how I would have lived without animals around me. I'm fascinated by them, both domestic pets and the wild community. They are just the most interesting things in the world to me, and it's made such a difference in my lifetime. And as you shall see soon, her life has made such a difference in animals' lifetimes all over the world. She said of her parents, and she's pictured here with the two of them, her daddy's dimple in display. I was blessed with a mother and father who said, taste the good stuff now and realize how fortunate and how wonderful things are this minute. Because enough minutes are not wonderful that you have to save up all the good ones to make it balance out. That's a pretty good analysis of her attitude toward life. When the family moved to Los Angeles, they had a, a very nice uh, little home in LA, but Betty really never talked in interviews about that early home, or uh, other than the fact that it was filled with animals and had kennels in the back. Um, what she talked about were the Sierra Nevadas, the mountains. Every summer, she and her parents would pack literally pack into the backwoods and they would go either to the Sierras or they would go to the Grand Canyon and they would live for about three weeks without seeing other people. She said it was the best opportunity to see wildlife ever and you saw them in their natural state. 
And she said they lived for those summers when they could get away and they could camp and they could see the animals. So in one of her books, she quoted her mother uh, on the question of, of getting a little older. She said, my mother always used to say, the older you get, the better you get, unless you're a banana. And that's kind of the sense of humor that this woman grew up in. She was educated at the Horace Mann Elementary School and she learned early that not only did she love to write and act, but she was good at both of them. She liked to write plays in particular, and she would write herself into a starring role in the plays that she wrote. She went to gra and graduated from Beverly Hills High School. There she was voted best looking in the Beverly Hills High School yearbook, and this is her picture from the yearbook, Dimple in Place. She danced and sang songs from The Merry Widow on an experimental television show one month after she graduated. And it was experimental. Television was just being born. It was not a national phenomenon by any means. She and one of the seniors with her went up uh, to the top floor of a building and they danced and sang and they were filmed and her parents were on the ground floor of the building watching the little monitor kind of set thing, seeing her on television. It was the first time she was on TV. When she was eight though, she made her entertainment debut. She was in a 1931 episode of a very popular radio serial. It was called Empire Builders. And she very proudly played the voice of a crying orphan baby on a train. For her class's graduation play at Beverly Hills High, she starred in the play that was the senior play, and she also had written it. Those years at Beverly Hills High School stayed with her. She loved her classmates. She loved the experience. And in 2014, when she went to the Beverly Hills Centennial Celebration, she sang the Beverly Hills High School fight song from memory. Many do not realize that she was also involved in World War II. She had an kind of a beginning to bloom sort of acting career, uh, radio being her primary area, but then World War II basically stopped all of that. So in 1941, she volunteered for what was called the American Women's Voluntary Services. And there she served as a truck driver and she would deliver supplies to the camps that were located in the Hollywood Hills. This was one of several women's auxiliary organizations, but it was the biggest one. In her group, there were 325,000 women volunteers. She served for nearly five years in this service. And she also made her screen debut during this time. She made a film for the Army. She and DeForest Kelly made a training film. It was entitled Time to Kill. And the educational film was designed to show the soldiers, the benefits that the military offered to them. Uh, and it was her first screen credit, Betty White. When the service was over, Betty set her sights on doing two things. One, she wanted to develop her career, but in the meantime, she was also experiencing what she referred to later as a sputtering love life. I call it love and marriage, take one. She met a very handsome young P-38 pilot and they fell in love. They got married in May of 1945 and moved to his hometown, Bell Center, Ohio, population at that time, 830. Los Angeles to Bell Center, big city to his family chicken farm. The marriage lasted six months. She lived on the chicken farm with him for four months, moved back to Los Angeles, and then got a divorce. 
Now, love and marriage, take two. This time, she meets an actor who's also a talent agent. His name is Lane Allen, and he comes to watch her in a play. They dated for some time, but when she got her first small role in a relatively insignificant movie, Betty broke it off because the career was more important. After she'd been away filming for a couple of months, when she returned home, there was a present from Lane. It was a recording of their song, I Love You for Sentimental Reasons. The two married two months later in 1947. He worked in Hollywood, as I said, as an agent and a casting director, and he also was an actor and he had a pretty successful career. They though divorced in 1949, when Alan asked Betty to forget her career, come home, stay home, start a family. She refused. She was very oriented toward career, and that's where she placed the emphasis. Later, she's going to find her one true love, but that is later. For now, she's happily single, and she's focused on career development. In the 40s, she was known mostly for her work in radio because it was mostly the only game in town. Her first work was commercial work, and she was pretty good in it. She would, you know, do a voice or whatever, or, or sometimes a special sound effect. She'd do anything that she could do to be in the entertainment business. Her big break came in 1949. Al Jarvis was a very, very popular radio disc jockey, and he decided he was gonna move his DJ show, records playing and so forth, to television. And he invited her to come along with him and play his Girl Friday. The first week, they played their records, and then they talked and then they played the records, and then they talked. And at the end of the week, the fans said, we don't want to hear the records. We can hear records anytime. We want to hear y'all talk. And so that, in one week, converted to the first talk show as such. And she and Jarvis were so quick on their feet. She had such a strong, quick sense of humor that they could play off each other for hours at a time. They even had to do their own commercials. So there was no, we will now cut away for to hear something from Betty Crocker. They were, she was Betty Crocker. They were doing their own commercials and then they'd go right back into the talk show sequence. Hollywood on television was filmed six days a week. It taught Betty an education on how to work in live television. She called it uh, college, college for live television or for the entertainment business. That experience, having to be that sharp, that often, that fast for that long, uh, laid the groundwork for her later television work, both in game shows and in late night interviews. In 1952, she broke ground, founding with a partner, Bandy Productions. It means that she is one of the very first female Hollywood producers. And she used that company to launch a number of sitcoms, which she starred in. Think about it. We think of her in our generation now and the younger generations. We think of her as a television actress. What she is, is a television pioneer. She's doing things other women weren't doing. And she set aside one marriage because of a chicken farm, but the other marriage because she was not willing to give up a career. She is focused on seeing what she can do uh, as a woman in the business. 1952 was her first situation comedy. It was called Life with Elizabeth. Uh, she plays a 1950s housewife who's always got a little yakety yak going on with her husband and she usually wins in those exchanges. She was uh, the co-creator and the producer for this series. It made her a much bigger name in television and a very young television awareness piece 
but the show ended after only two seasons. The kinds of things that they did are reminiscent of George Burns and Gracie Allen. For example, um, Alvin is working, the husband, is working on a big floor finishing, varnishing project. And he has accidentally painted his wife, Elizabeth, into a closet so she can't get out. So Elizabeth, realizing it, says, I'm going to ask you a direct question and I want a direct answer. And Alvin says, shoot. Elizabeth says, don't tempt me. 1956, she starts her second situation comedy. It's called Date with the Angels. It starred Betty White, but she wasn't happy with the script. Remember, she's a writer too, and she can tell when it doesn't quite work the way she wants to. It just lasted two seasons. One of the things that I found most interesting about this early career development of Betty White was her close friendship that developed with Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball's mother was one of White's mother's best friends. Who knew? Lucy's mother was a concert pianist in the beginning of her life, and she'd given up her career to be a mom. Betty's mother was a homemaker from beginning all the way through. Both of the women, though, both of these, the mothers of these two women who would become mega stars, taught their girls to stand up for themselves and to stand tall in a very male-dominated entertainment business. White became friends with Lucy while she was taping this second situation comedy, The Date with the Angels, because it was taping at Desilu Studios at the same time Lucy and Ricky were taping I Love Lucy, so they, they became friends. Both of the girls enjoyed television fame and had their own production companies. No easy achievement for women in show business at this time. They shared a 30-year friendship until Ball died. One of their favorite things to do, because it was Lucy's favorite thing to do, was to get together for a light lunch and to play backgammon. And in this book, when Betty White's telling her own story, she remembers that and she talks about how frustrating it was for her because she loved games, loved to play games, had never played backgammon. Lucy insisted that she come and she would teach her how to play backgammon. And she said it was the most frustrating experience of her life because Lucy was a heck of a backgammon player, but a terrible teacher, and she never caught on to exactly how she was supposed to play it. The situation comedies, Betty White was asked, what's the key to the success to a situation comedy? And she said this, the writers are the stars of every really successful sitcom. The actors act, but it's what they say that'll either carry or bury a show. In 1958, she tried The Betty White Show. It was a variety show in the daytime. Uh, in it, um, she danced, she sang, she acted in comedy sketches, and she did interviews of celebrity guests, uh, and her company produced it. It only lasted one season. In 1958, her career took a, a fascinating turn, which would then be part of her life for decades. She began appearing on game shows. They were very popular in the late 50s and through the 60s and 70s and even today, frankly. She made appearances in over 30 game shows, including What's My Line, Password, To Tell the Truth, I've Got a Secret, Match Game, and Pyramid. And I bet some of you are old enough to remember some of those. And at this time, we get to Love and Marriage, Take Three. White met Alan Ludden, a well-known television game show host, when she was working on Password. The couple dated for nearly two years, and it was a most unusual courtship. They announced their engagement in 1963. White was living in California. Ludden was working and living in New York. So their dating was pretty long distance. When she would get invited to Password, which he was hosting, then she would come to New York and she would stay and do the 
the show when they would date, and then she would go back to California. She also, in the early part of their relationship, was in a very serious relationship with another man. She and Ludden were hired to appear in a summer stock production on the East Coast, and they played husband and wife. Her sort of boyfriend came to watch the play, and he noticed to his irritation that the final scene of the play had the husband and wife, Ludden and White, kiss. And he found the kiss lasted too long and seemed far too serious. And uh, with that, the relationship evaporated. White, through time, met Ludden's three children. Ludden had been married before and was a widower. His wife had died of cancer. She got along very well with the children and she even spent Thanksgiving with the family. But then she hurried back to California because after all, she didn't want anything to get too serious. Back in New York City, after the holidays, White came to New York to do Password again. Ludden gave her a jewel box and in it was a beautiful gold wedding ring encircled entirely in diamonds. She gave it right back. He put it in his pocket. She told him that she was not going to be pushed, that she had been married twice before, that she loved her life, and that was it. So the next time she saw him, he had the wedding ring on his neck around it in a chain, and he wore it constantly. And he said, I'm just keeping it for you because one day you're going to say yes. The Easter after that, White received a package from Ludden. It was a plush white bunny with ruby, sapphire, and diamond earrings clipped to its bunny ears. The note said, these won't fit on a chain, please say yes. When he called her last night, la that night, uh, Betty White didn't say hello. She simply said, yes. The couple was married on June 14, 1964 at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. Again, it was her third marriage, his second, and she became stepmother to his three children. Between 1956 and 1974, Betty White added another layer to her entertainment business portfolio. She became a parade host and commentator for the Tournament of Roses Parade for NBC. That was really quite a coup. And then in 1963, she began hosting the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. And she hosted that until 1972. She was always with a co-host and a frequent co-host for her was an old friend of hers, Lauren Green. 1971-72, Alan Ludden produced a television show which was the first time the public became aware of Betty White's devotion to the animal world. The name of it was The Pet Set, and you can see it on YouTube now, the past uh, retire store uh, series. It's called The Pet Set, and it, in it, White interviews celebrities and their pets. This is a picture of James Brolin, with his great dame, Buck, and Betty White. And what she would do, she would interview the star about the animal that he brought. She also would have a wild animal that would be brought in from the zoo, and she would give some information about that animal and, and where it lived and how it lived. She said, when she was asked once about animals, she said, you can always tell about somebody by the way they put their hands on an animal. And I think that's right. 1973, lightning struck. After over 30 years in the entertainment business, White is hired to play what would be one of the two biggest television roles in her 80 year career. So Mary Tyler Moore, that ran from 1970 to 1977. 
Betty White didn't join it until several years in. It was a situation comedy. It had an ensemble cast, which Betty White always said was her favorite way to act so that the members in the ensemble could play off each other with uh, facial expressions as well as what they were saying. White was cast as Sue Ann Nivens, an outrageous flirt, with a gift for both a double entendre and perfect timing. Sue Ann was the happy homemaker who delivered household tips in a relentlessly perky way, but when the camera was finished with Sue Ann's little taping of her section, she turned off Happy Homemaker and she became the real Sue Ann, a conniving backstabber. Sue Ann is deeply competitive, loves to point out her colleagues' weaknesses, and she's probably the queen of passive aggression. Betty White played her perfectly. For example, when Sue Ann congratulates Mary on her promotion to producer, Sue Ann says, Mary, believe me, I'm proud that you haven't been disheartened by those who murmur that you've sacrificed your femininity to your ambition. The Mary Tyler Moore show was an enormous success. It ran eight seasons. Moore finally just decided she couldn't do it anymore, so they stopped it. And there were various spin-off programs that came from it, Rhoda, for example, for Valerie Harper. White earned Best Supporting Actress Emmy for her Sue Ann role. The 1970s were overall a really wonderful decade for Betty White. After the Mary Tyler Moore fo uh, show folded, she made a number of guest appearances, most notably on the Carol Burnett show. You see her picture there, she and Carol in their cheerleader suits. Also, Donnie and Marie and the love boat, and she just had a great time. She also became a very favorite guest on late night talk shows, which were beginning to be very popular venues uh, for television watchers. The Tonight Show was one of her favorites. This is a picture of Betty White and Johnny Carson when she's one of his guests there. Johnny Carson said of her years later, 1987, Betty's somewhere between Mother Teresa and a call girl. I'm just not quite sure where. Also in the 1970s, and this is probably because of Alan Lowe's producing the pet set, she becomes very active in the Morris Animal Foundation, which is a health, animal health organization. It funds campaign health studies for dogs, cats, lizards, wildlife. And she also became devoted to the Los Angeles Zoo at the same time. But in 1980, Alan Ludden was diagnosed with a terminal stomach cancer. He had moved to California. They had had a good life in California and they had found a special place where they wanted to build their home, their forever home. It was being built during the year that Ludden was dying from cancer. He died at age 63, quite young. White and Ludden managed to get the home built enough that they could live there for just a little while. And she had a, a bedroom suite furnished completely for him and for her and they were able to stay there three nights before he had to be flown back to Los Angeles to the hospital where he died. They had helped fund the construction of a new exhibit at the Los Angeles Zoo during this last year of his life. It was called the Koala House and it was to have koala bears. Work on it was completed right about the same time that Ludden passed away. When he died, the plaza in front of the Koala House was named the Alan Ludden Plaza to honor him and his contributions. That naming was made possible because they had a lot of memorial gifts that came in to the zoo in his honor, plus one very large anonymous gift, which in this book, Betty White explains, was from Grant Tinker, Mary Tyler Moore's husband. 
Tinker and Mary Tyler Moore had been very close friends with the Ludens. And when they divorced, Mary Tyler Moore remained a friend and Grant Tinker, Tinker remained a friend. Uh, it was Tinker that Betty White turned to to plan the memorial service for Alan, and he did. I want you to think about something. Although she had lost the love of her life, White's life was far from over. She still had a 40-year career in front of her. Betty White grieved at the death of her husband, even though they had known for a year that it was terminal. In fact, at that point, options for medical treatment were so limited they talked over all the options chemotherapy radiation in its early forms and they made the decision together to forget it all just simply to live whatever days they had left to the fullest afterward she was asked how she handled that level of grief and this is what she said there's no formula Keep busy with your work and your life. You cannot become a professional mourner. It doesn't help you or others. Replay the good times. Be grateful for the years you had. In 1985, four years after Alan's passing, lightning strikes twice. This time, she lands the role of Rose Nyland in Golden Girls. Many critics claim, state, insist that this was the finest role that she ever played in her whole career. She won an Emmy for Rose. Rose was unbelievably naive. She believed everything that she was told. She wasn't ditzy exactly, she was just First level, naive. She you said it, she believed it. If somebody said they could eat a horse, she would call the APA, APCA. Two of her gems of wisdom. <clears throat> Once she said, you know what they say, you can lead a herring to water, but you have to walk really fast or he will die. And another on the show, the character Rose said, could we get in trouble having a garage sale? I mean, after all, we're not actually selling a garage. That show, Golden Girls, of course, it spun out to some other things too, but that really was a highlight of her work as an actress. But once again, she's, she's not through. Later, she's gonna do more work that is centered around guest appearances on already running shows. Uh, and also her work in game shows and her work as a, a, like a late night talk show host or a guest on a late night show. Here's a list of some of the things that she worked on. 93, Bob, 95, maybe this time, then the John, John Marquette show, the story of Santa Claus, Ally McBeal, Ladies Man, Suddenly Susan, the 70s show, The Bold and the Beautiful, she played a soap opera mom. Boston Legal, 30 Rock, My Name is Earl, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, SpongeBob SquarePants, and Toy Story 4. Of course, several of those are voiceovers for animated pieces. She also began appearing in movies again, and this introduced her to yet another generation of fans. 1962 had been her official movie debut. She had done the war film with De DeForest Kelly, but in 1962, she played a very serious role in the movie Advising Consent. And a lot of people don't realize she was in that film, but she was and she did well. 1998, she did two, Hard Rain and Dennis the Menace Strikes Again. 1999, she started Lake Placid, but it was in 2009, that she really hit pay dirt in a movie role. The movie was The Proposal. Sandra Bullock was the star there. 
In the proposal, White plays Grandma Annie, and she's very saucy, and she's brutally honest. She, um, White, makes a lot of money with this movie. It was her first genuine box office hit. It made $317 million worldwide. But you know what? The next year, 2010, was even better. She appeared in a Super Bowl commercial. It was the Snickers commercial, Snickers candy bars. And so with the black face and on her, black marks under her face as the football players do, she went out and played with the team. And it was the highest rated commercial for Super Bowl in 2010 out of all of them. As a result of an internet campaign, as this young group of people are beginning to see her and know who she is, they wrote in a request that Saturday Night Live have her as a guest host. And so when she was 88 years old, she became the oldest celebrity to ever host the show. Also in 2010, after numerous Emmy nominations and uh, winning awards, she won what was probably the most important award to her. It was the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Screen Actors Guild. This is a picture of her with the award, and she looks lovely. Uh, she's very happy about this. This is the culmination of an 80-year career. It is an acknowledgement by her peers that she is a valuable member of Hollywood. Technology was a little problem for her. On face on um, Saturday Night Live, when she's doing the, the uh, guest part, she talks about the problem with Facebook that she, until she did Saturday Night Live, she didn't even know what it was. This is a quote that she said later about technology. People tell me, but Betty, Facebook is a great way to connect with old friends. Well, at my age, if you want to connect with old friends, you need a Ouija board. Even though she didn't like social media, she didn't really use social media all that much, at the time of her passing this past December, she had over 2 million Twitter followers. One of the achievements the awards that she was given, which might have been ignored by many, was one of the most heartfelt for Betty White. She was named an honorary forest ranger. It was the fulfillment of a lifelong dream that started with those camping trips up in the Sierras. As a child, she wanted to be a forest ranger when she grew up. As she told ABC News later, Back then, girls were not allowed to become forest rangers. They weren't allowed to become movie producers either, or television producers, or have their own production companies. But she broke through a lot of walls to get through those. 2011, a little lightning strike. The third one, a series. It's called Hot in Cleveland, a situation comedy. It ran for six seasons. She won several awards for her work. Uh, and she loved it. Again, she wasn't on every week, but she would make appearances and they were memorable. In 2012, she celebrated her 90th birthday. I love this picture of her with her birthday cake. If you look very carefully, among the roses and the candles is a little miniature golden retriever. So that love of animals is carried through. When asked about aging, she said, so you may not be as fast on your feet and the image in your mirror may be a little disappointing, but if you're still functioning and not in pain, gratitude should be the name of the game. I choose today not to list the long list of the awards that she got for different things. You can read her book or the others and find out those. But I want to point out her achievements, which were major accomplishments for a woman in her time. She was the first woman to produce a national television show. She beat Lucille Ball to that. She was the first woman to host a talk show. 
She was the first woman to star in a sitcom. She was the first female producer to hire a female director. And she was the first woman ever to receive an Emmy for Outstanding Game Show Host. Both Alan Ludden and Betty White were inducted into the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The stars, her star is on one side and his was placed posthumously next to hers. When it was awarded at the ceremony, when his star was unveiled, White said this, I cannot express what this day means to me. Don't be surprised if during the wee hours of the morning, our stars are fooling around. She was often asked what the secret to her longevity was, especially the older she got and she kept working. And they want you to know, you know, how do you do this? And she said, I'm a health nut. My favorite food is hot dogs with french fries. And my exercise, I have a two-story house and a very bad memory, so I'm up and down those stairs a lot. I don't need sleep. I just go to the hotel and have a cold hot dog and vodka on the rocks. Plans were well in place to celebrate her 100th birthday. Six days before her death, she suffered a stroke and the cause of death was complications from that stroke. She had insisted that her funeral and burial be absolutely private. She was cremated and her ashes given to Glenn Kaplan, who was the man in charge of her advanced healthcare directive. Her funeral was held, it was private, her ashes were strewn, we do not know where. The only thing that the reporters have been able to ferret out so far is that she is not buried back east by Alan Ludden. Robert Redford was the topic for several of her one-liners during the last several decades of her life, they, they would ask, people would ask her, you know, who she most admired or would like to know. And Robert Redford, she always thought Robert Redford was just wonderful. And so when Robert Redford heard of her death, he said, Betty lived life devoted to her craft and her love of animals. She made us all laugh, including me. I had a crush on her, too. The tributes to Betty White were many. The Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association raised more than $70,000 through a one-day nationwide Betty White Challenge campaign that encouraged fans to donate to animal welfare organizations on the day that would have been her 100th birthday. There were 1,700 donations from 49 states and 11 foreign countries. Google fixed it so that if you typed Betty White, animated rose petals would fall from the top of the screen, ending with the message, thank you for being a friend, which was the title of the theme song from Golden Girls. The Cincinnati Zoo named a newborn penguin, Rose Nyland. And here in Louisiana, in New Orleans, the Betty White Parade was held through the French Quarter on the day after her 100th birthday. On life, she said, I have no regrets at all, none. I consider myself to be the luckiest old broad on two feet. I think she was, or at least one of the luckiest. Animals loved her, people loved her, even in death, we love her. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something about her that you didn't know. And I, I encourage you to read each of these books, but if you can only read one, read Betty in her own words. Thank you. Thank you for